Hi everybody, this is the video for <clears throat> the second stats lab for this week. And it will be similar to the previous one where that reading the textbook first will be very helpful. And then doing the labs next is the steps I would recommend. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> this video, I'll quickly go over, uh, highlight the book, but I'll also show you what's going on here. There's lots of different files. Uh, a lot of that's because we can't sort of merge things and um, also it just helps keep things straight. And so if you look up here on top, that's your stats lab number one, that, that assignment is due. And then the second stats lab is right here. This actually says SPSS lab. I should probably say stats lab. Let me just check. Yeah, let me just change that. Sorry about this, but I want, to, I want to edit this real quickly before we go on. So there's the stats lab for two right here. And that's right underneath the assignment for the stats lab number one. <clears throat> and so this document is a document that you're going to be filling out that has all the questions on it. There's three parts to this one, just like the other one. And <clears throat> again, I recommend reading the textbook first and whether you want to read the whole chapter or whether you want to read parts of the chapter and then do the labs, it's really up to you. And so this lecture will not go over the content of the statistics because I think your book does a really good job of reviewing it. And since it is reviewing <clears throat> stuff that you've already had in another course, I'll, I'll leave it for the textbook to do uh, most of the review. Uh, if you have any questions about statistics, specifically, you can attend uh, one of the live sessions that we have four times a week uh, that are announced on Canvas. And so just to sort of show you the structure of this lab, again, there's three parts. And basically, because there's three inferential statistics that I want you to know how to use SPSS for. And so the first one is, uh, pair t test. So again, you do not have to have SPSS. I run SPSS for you and have outputs for you to interpret. So watch this video first before you do part number one. This goes over how to run it and how to interpret the outputs. And then there's two parts to the output for pair t test. So those are right there. Um, so to answer your questions on this lab, you'll need to look at those and interpret those outputs. And then the next stat that I want you to do is independent t-test. So once again, this video goes over about how to run independent t-test and how to interpret the output. And in this case, there's just one output. Um, in this output, there are three separate independent t-tests that are run. So the video goes over that, uh, but there is just one output here to look at for that part. So that's part two. Part three is the one-way ANOVA. Again, watch this video. This video will explain how to run a one-way ANOVA using SPSS, and it will explain how to interpret the data. So for one-way ANOVAs, uh, it, for each of those analyses, it's split up into two parts because there's so much um, output that it's hard to get on one screen on one page. So part number one will give you descriptive statistics, things like mean and standard deviations for the different levels of the IV. In this case, it's a one-way ANOVA, so those, are, those levels are groups also. And then it also will give you the overall F-test, so basically the ANOVA summary table will be given in this output. And the second part of the output are post-hoc tests. If you don't know what those are, read the book and also watch the video. Um, so part two are, are the post hoc. So if you get a significant F, look at part two to see where the differences are between the groups. Same thing for parts three and four. So part three in this case is the second question we're looking at, the second ANOVA analysis. And part three is the first part, which is descriptive statistics like mean and standard deviations for the different groups. It will also give you the ANOVA summary table. And then part four is the post hocs for that problem. 
And so if you have a significant F in part three, look at part four to see which groups differ. And at the bottom here is where you will submit your stats lab number two assignment. And so I'm gonna now go over the textbook a little bit. Um, but basically, again, the textbook, I would, I would read the textbook first and then I would do the labs. And again, I'm gonna leave the textbook to review the statistics with you because the textbook's pretty good. And so, and if you know your stuff, you can skim through it. If you don't know it, you can read in more detail. So you get a lot of choice here in terms of how much time you'll spend on this to understand stats well. And so this chapter that we're gonna be doing in the second part is chapter 13, I believe. I think this is the easiest way for me to confirm that is just look at our revised schedule and yes indeed it is chapter 13 in our textbook and this will go over inferential statistics so in the first part of reviewing stats we went over descriptive statistics which are describing a sample's data however you do not test any hypotheses with descriptive statistics and so now we're gonna be doing testing of hypotheses with inferential statistics. So this chapter we'll be looking at inferential statistics, uh, testing hypotheses, and then inferring conclusions about our population from our samples data. That's what inferential statistics are. So do read the opening, of course. I'm just gonna highlight what's here. Uh, Go over the null hypothesis. So if you don't remember hypothesis testing, this is a good review. So understanding what a null hypothesis is and understanding what alternative hypotheses are. This is all a review of things that you've had in your statistics course. So hypothesis testing's here. It talks about p-values. It talks about alphas. So the alpha is you set that uh, in terms of what is an acceptable type one error of having a false positive in your findings. And it talks about significance. And there's a little box here of, about what P means exactly. And it goes over sample size and relationship strength. Uh, essentially, if you remember from your stats class, the larger your sample size, the easier it is to find something to be statistically significant. Uh, you can think about it in a very simple way, which is uh, when you have more pieces of data, a larger sample size, uh, you can have a little bit more reliability and a little bit confidence in your inferences. If your sample size is quite small, there's only a few pieces of data, then you can't be so confident in your probability statements about what's going on in your data. So do read this. Read this about statistical significance and practical significance. I think a lot of that has to do with effect size that we talked about in your stats class. So do read this again, review this in the textbook. And so the next part is really where your lab's gonna come in. So. Uh, specific statistics, and some of them are what you're going to be using in your papers for your own research studies. And so review the t-test. So if you don't remember a t-test, review it. A good starting point might be the review, the one sample t-test, although uh, one sample t-test is uh, very rarely used in actual psychological research, but it is a starting point. So if you don't remember a t-test is, it would be a good starting point to review this. And it goes over calculation uh, examples. So if you're not quite understanding conceptually what it is, they do have calculation examples. So the first thing that you're gonna be doing for your second lab on stats in this class will be a pair t-test. So dependent samples means pair t-test. Why are they dependent samples? Well, it's because in a pair t-test, you have the same people being measured on a DV twice. So let's say that I think the color red increases attraction uh, in people. And so in a pair of t-test design, which is within subjects, 
I'm going to have everybody look at somebody in red, rate their attraction. And then I'm going to have them look at somebody in green and rate their attraction to that person. So I've been measured twice on attraction with those two conditions of red versus green. And so they're called dependent samples because it's the same people. You've measured the same people twice. So they're kind of dependent because different people have different standards of attraction and different things they look for. And so the scores on red are dependent related to the scores on green because it's the same person doing it twice. So um, that's why it's called pair t-test. Also, you have two measures of the dependent variable for each person. So dependent samples t-test, pair t-test, read this, uh, refresh your memories. This is part one of the lab exercises. And then the second part is independent samples t-test. So why is it independent samples? This is when you use between subjects design. So if I have the same question about red increasing attraction towards people, in an independent samples t-test with a between subjects design, half my subjects, half my people, my participants are gonna see red, somebody in red and rate their attraction. And then half the people are gonna see green and rate that person's attraction. So each person's only measured once. And if you do your study right, those are independent numbers. There are different people doing the ratings. Your groups are independent groups. So independent samples, t-test, independent t-test. And so again, this is with two separate groups and each person gets only one level of the IV. They either see red, they either see green and they're only measured once on the dependent variable. So here you're comparing two groups. You're comparing the red group, which is different people, versus the green group, which are different people in terms of their attraction level. So you're comparing those two separate groups. Whereas a pair t-test, you're looking at the same people and you're comparing them within the person Within myself, do I, did I think somebody dressed in red is more attractive than somebody who dressed in green within myself? So do read this for the review. And this is the second part of the lab. So you will be going through about how you do independent t-tests via SPSS and how to interpret the output. And then uh, we have uh, analysis of variance. And so in the analysis of variance, there's two different types and they uh, mirror the independent and the pair t-test. The first one that's discussed here is actually mirroring the independent t-test. Because remember, independent t-test is between subjects. Each person gets just one level of the IV. T-test compares just two things. So there's two levels of the IV and there's two separate groups red and green. So a one-way ANOVA is similar in that it's a between subjects design, except in ANOVA, you have three or more levels of the IV. And so t-test, you're comparing two things. ANOVA is you're comparing three or more things. So in this case, again, it's between subjects for a one-way ANOVA. So I'm gonna take the same th question about red increasing attraction. So let's say that I have red, green, and blue as my levels of the IV. It's between subjects for a one-way ANOVA, so each person's gonna just get one level of the IV. So one-third of my subjects, some of third of my participants will see somebody dressed in red, rate their attraction. One-third will see somebody in blue, rate their attraction. And the last third will see somebody in green, rate their attraction. So it's between subjects, each person gets just one level. They see just one color, and they are measured on the dependent variable just once. Uh, but it's ANOVA, so we're comparing three groups in this case. So three or more groups we're comparing in a one-way ANOVA. So this is the third part of your lab. So go ahead and read this. Refresh your memory what a one-way ANOVA is. 
And then go ahead and do the lab. There's a video for the lab explaining how to run this in SPSS. So for ANOVAs, knowing post hacks are very important. So read this about post hacks, and I talk about this in the video for the SPSS running of this analysis and how to do it, how to interpret it with the output. Then the second type of ANOVA is a repeated measures ANOVA. Repeated measures ANOVA is similar to a pair T test in that it has a within subjects design. So within subjects design, so when we did the pair T test, we had red and green, I believe. And so in a, within subjects design, ev everybody in your study sees somebody in red, they write their attraction, they see somebody in green, they write their attraction. So they get both levels of the IV and they're measured twice in pair T test design. So ANOVAs are three or more levels, always. So t-tests are always two things you're comparing. ANOVAs, you're comparing three or more things. And so with this ANOVA, repeated measures ANOVA, we have a within subjects design. So everybody's going to see at least three colors in this case. So let's take the three colors that we talked about with the one way. So three colors, red, green, and blue. So if we're doing a within subjects design using repeated measures ANOVA, Everybody in our sample is going to see somebody in red. They're going to rate their attraction. And they're going to see somebody in green, rate their attraction. They're going to see somebody in blue, rate their attraction. So each person in the study sees red, green, and blue. They get all the levels of the IV. And in this case, they're measured three times. They're repeatedly measured on the dependent variable of attraction. So there's the red attraction scores, there's the blue attraction scores, and there's the green attraction scores. And everybody has a score for each of the colors. And just like the pair t-test, you're asking yourself, within people, do they see somebody in red as more attractive versus when they saw somebody green or blue? So you're looking within the person and whether they differ in their ratings across the levels of the IV, in this case, the colors. So do read this section, remind yourself what that is. There is no SPSS exercise in the lab for this for two reasons. Uh, maybe a practical reason is that none of you are going to be doing this for your papers because none of you have a, a ANOVA design of repeated measures. And so uh, that's not going to be something you're going to be using. And then second, your SPSS does not work very well with repeated measures ANOVAs. And I'm, it's probably an old quirk in how the thing was programmed in the old days. Uh, but to run a repeated measures ANOVA, it's extremely difficult. And it's very weird and quirky and has lots of strange things in the output that you have to ignore. So let's just keep our job simple. And we just won't do it because of those complications. Factorial ANOVA. So we went over this design before. So this is about main effects and interactions. And again, um, there is no SPSS lab in this at the moment. Um, however, when I go over your studies individually, it's possible we may run these analyses. Uh, so. I, I will think about your data, and we will deal with this individually per group. Uh, but the basics, you already know. All that stuff that we did on factorial designs and talking about main effects and interactions, that's something conceptually that you're going to be using if you were going to interpret the actual data from a factorial ANOVA. We've already done correlation, so you can read this. But we did dealt with correlations as an inferential statistic for the last part of Stats Lab 1. So you can read this, but it's very similar to what we talked about before. And so then the rest of the textbook just covers uh, things that you should know about statistics. So uh, things such as errors, so type 1 and type 2 errors. You should be reviewing this in the textbook. 
Uh, they talk about the file drawer problem here uh, and p-hacking. So do read these things. These are important to know. Uh, it talks about power. So this is something that we actually talked about in class earlier, and uh, it should be a review from your stats courses. And then uh, read this thing about the whole debate about null hypothesis testing. Um, so with us, with our statistics, we teach both the null hypothesis testing, but we also teach effect size. And so uh, for your labs, actually, I ask you to do some effect sizes. And so for your t-test, I don't ask you to. So. But I'm just going to flash this because you will probably be asked to do this uh, for your papers. And I will talk to you more about this. Um, so if you have a t-test, you could do this. So this is for an independent t-test. The paired t-test formula is uh, different. And we'll talk about that if you need it. But basically, I recommend this. And so if you're looking at t-test and the effect sizes, R square is great because you can use this formula for any t-test whether it's paired or independent. You just take the T, the actual T that you find, you square it, you do the same thing on the bottom, you take the T squared, then you add the degrees of freedom, you divide those numbers, and then you get an R squared, which is the percent of variance in a dependent variable that's directly linked to the independent variable. So if I did this for my color study and my R square came out to be, uh, let's say, 0.33. What would that mean? That would mean that 33% of the variance in the attraction ratings from my participants in my study was directly linked to the color they saw, whether it was red or green. That's what the effect size means. And then for the ANOVA, this is how you calculate the effect size. And so this is eta square, and this is just like the R square. So the R square is exactly the same thing as this. This is just called eta square for ANOVAs. And in, in the one way ANOVA, how you figure out the eta square is you take the sum of squares between groups, so the variance between groups, so the differences between red and green and blue in terms of the attraction, and you divide that by the variance in total, which is how much people just vary in total in terms of their attraction ratings, regardless of the IV, regardless of color in this case. So this is literally the percent of variance in the dependent variable directly linked to the IV, in this case, colors, the color groups, red, green, blue. And so in your ANOVA summary table, you're going to be given the sum of squares between and the sum of squares total. And so when you're asked to report the effect size from the SPSS, this is how you do it. So do read this part. This part goes into that debate about null hypothesis testing versus effect size. Again, this is review of your stats class that you had. It also reviews confidence intervals here. So actually, uh, in the t-test SPSS output, I ask you to report the confidence intervals. And so that is here. And it talks about this Bayesian stuff. So you should just sort of read this. And then this is more conceptual stuff in the chapter. So um, talking about how we do science, uh, because typically things that get published in journals are things that find effects. And so earlier in the stats book, it talks, or stats books, earlier in this chapter, it talks about the file drawer problem, which is if you don't find an effect, you don't submit it to a journal because nobody cares about that there's no effect. So there's, there's an idea that perhaps there's a bunch of things that, a bunch of studies that don't find an effect and we don't know it because you can't publish them. And so uh, this part of the chapter talks about moving away from this whole thing about uh, just publishing in journals and only uh, effects 
get published in journals to more of an open science where people are discussing findings more openly without the worry of being published in a prestigious journal or uh, worrying about whether you found something or not. So do read this. And I think we're getting towards the end of the chapter. So that's the end of the chapter. Um, so as you saw, there's some um, good reviews of things, especially for your knowledge of stats with t-test and ANOVAs. Also, it reviews some conceptual things, some of the things that you definitely should know, like type 1 and type 2 errors. Uh, but it also gets into some higher order debates about hypothesis testing versus effect sizes and how we publish and disseminate our research findings in psychology. Um, so hopefully this video was pretty useful to you. Uh, I'm glad it was relatively short. Uh, and that way, I think uh, it's, we're not wasting each other's time uh, with me doing a long video, but you're reading this stuff anyway. Um, and so anyway, I'm babbling on at the end. So I'm just going to end this right now. And if you have questions about statistics, anything about statistics, you can come to the open Q&A sessions that we have live four times a week.